The American Antiquarian Society was founded in 1812 by Isaiah Thomas. Our Isaiah did not play basketball. <laughs> However, he did pose for his portrait, which graces the entrance to the Antiquarian Hall as you came in, and he used the press upstairs in that balcony to help start the American Revolution. And after independence was won, he uh, used that press and others to create a fortune as the premier printer and publisher of his generation. Today, the American Antiquarian Society is a national research library of pre-20th century American history and culture, and a center of learning where people of all ages, professions, and backgrounds come to study and discuss virtually any and all aspects of American life before 1876. Our collective policy stems directly from Isaiah Thomas. An example of this is the music you are about to hear tonight. These songs all come from the Isaiah Thomas Broadside Ballad Collection. Thomas worked with a Boston printer, Nathaniel Coverley, to collect as many cheap, popular, one-sheet songs being sold and consumed in Boston as they could find. Eventually, Thomas collected some 300 of them and then bound them into four volumes. When Thomas presented his collection to the American Antiquarian Society, he wrote that he had the broadsides bound up for preservation to show what articles of this kind are in vogue with the vulgar at this time, 1814. We might say Thomas was creating the early republic's version of Billboard's Hot 100. <laughs> the Isaiah Thomas Broadside Ballad Collection is now also a digital project entitled Isaiah Thomas Broadside Ballads, Verses in Vogue with the Vulgar. This AAS website contains digital versions of all the ballads and over 800 images and 300 mini essays that contextualize the ballads. The site also contains digital recordings by David and Ginger Hildebrand, some of which of these ballads. Uh, in, in fact, most of the music that you hear tonight you can also hear online. Now I want to introduce you to our performers tonight. There, there is a, there's full biographical information of, on both of our performers in your program. I will simply say that both of these people are wonderful music, musicians and incisive scholars of early American music and culture. They perform, consult, and lecture widely throughout the United States and have appeared on national radio and television. Together they have created six CDs, some of which we are selling here tonight. Please welcome David and Ginger Hildebrand. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. It's really exciting to be here. We, we're so thrilled to get the invitation to dig into this incredible material, uh, some of which we've worked with many years going back, but to have the opportunity to just have at it with this collection, incredible collection of music, it's been a lot of fun. However, with more than 400 pieces of music to choose from, we whittled it down to 300 tonight. I don't know you have the time on your hands. Uh, we tried to, to do a bit of a sampling. Uh, there's a song from the French and Indian War about a hero still in America's, America's mind in 1813. There are, of course, songs of the period leading up to the Revolution and during the Revolution. There's a great Yankee Doodle, you better sing along with us when you get to that, um, that has to do with honoring the uh, tremendous uh, naval victory of old iron sons against the Guerriere. Um, but there's also there are a couple of light and humorous pieces. We thought that might be the best way to start. This is a, a whimsical <coughs> fantasy story, I guess, of a couple of animals acting out human things. Frog and mouse. Hey, Paul, sit 
surely They soon arrived at Nelson's Hall He gave a loud tap and he gave a loud call Pray, Mrs. Mouse, are you within? Hey, Paul, so roly. Pray, Mrs. Mouse, are you within? Then the clown will get into spirit with a roly, 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 that had musical type, and so we needed to use old melodies to write our new American songs and say our new American thoughts. And so, we have this pot of beautiful melody, um, and you'll, you'll hear a lot of these tonight. We, we love this music. Um, and, and so, people will, will write songs over and over and over again to these melodies that we all own. And, and it's, it's not stealing the melody. I get that a lot. Why would they steal that melody? <laughs> it's honoring the melody again and again to use it because we all know it. Um, we still do it today. And, uh, and, and, and we, I hope you'll recognize some of these melodies at least that we're doing. But uh, it's one of the things that makes what we do so joyous. We did a program this morning uh, over at Bancroft School for the fourth and sixth grade kids. And part of that program is a guessing game where we try to replace some of these melodies and ask them to raise their hands if they recognize them. Uh, this next one, I hope you all will recognize too, because they thought of things like, oh yeah, isn't that... This is the melody. Say it. This is the way we wash our hands. Hi, Dean Day at the school. 
Christmas Day. The hills are bustled round and round. The hills are bustled round and round. It's all over the place. Lazy Mary, will you get up? Yeah. So, the, the brief story behind that melody is it was named after an actress named Nancy Dawson. Nancy Dawson came to fame when the Beggar's Opera was being performed, and the man who was supposed to perform the role of Peachum was sick, and she stood in his place as a female actor for a man's role. And they caught on, and the song is associated with her. We find it as a loyalist uh, melody in New York, in the American Revolution. But going back before then, here is a Nancy Dawson that shows up in the Isaiah and Thomas collection. Tear in this act shall suppress your just claim. 
Nor stain with dishonor America's name. In freedom we're born and in freedom we live. Our purses are ready, steady and steady. Not as slaves, but as free men, our money will give. Our worthy forefathers, let's give them a cheer. To climates unknown, did courageously steer. Through oceans to deserts, for freedom they came. And dying bequeathed us their freedom and name. In freedom we're born, and in freedom we live. Our purses are ready, steady, friends, steady. Not as slaves, but as free men, our money will give. Come shake your dull noodles, your pumpkins and ball, and own that you're mad at fair liberty's call. No scandalous conduct can add to your shame. Condemned to dishonor, inherit the same. In folly you're born, and in folly you live. To madness to steady, stupidly steady. Not as men, but as monkeys, these tokens you'll give. Our grandsire of Satan, now give him a cheer. Would act like yourselves, and as wildly would steer. So great an example in prospects to keep. Whilst you are alive, old deals he must sleep. In folly you're born, and nolly you live, to madness still ready, and stupidly steady. Not as men, but as monkeys, those tokens you give. And they say back to you, Come swallow your bumpers, your Tories, and roar, that the sons of fair freedom are bumper once more. But know that no cutthroats our spirits contain, nor a host of oppressors shall smother the flame. In freedom we're born, and like sons of the brave, we'll never surrender, but sweat to defend her, and scorn to survive if unable to save. Our grandsires, blessed heroes, will give them a tear, nor sully their honors by stooping to fear. Through deaths and through dangers, the trophies they won, we dare be their rivals, nor will be undone. In freedom we're born, and like sons of the brave, we'll never surrender, but swear to defend her, and scorn to survive if unable to save. Then join hand in hand, brave Americans all, to be free is to live, to be slaves is to fall. As the land such a dastard to scorns not a lord, who dreads not a fetter much more than a sword. In freedom we're born, and like sons of the brave, we'll never surrender, but swear to defend her, and scorn to survive if unable to save. Gender roles are about exactly reversed what they should be, and we apologize for that. Um, you don't want to hear David play the fiddle, and uh, <laughs> so so it just happens. Um, uh, 
Only, only men and boys played fiddles and violins in the 18th century. Um, it, was, it was a fashion thing that convinced um, What's really a reputation odd? thing. What's really odd though, especially, your reputation is especially important if you're the upper class. But it turns out that many of the ballads being sung on the street corners in cities like Boston and Philadelphia were being sung by women who were peddlers of ballads, who were poorer women, who would go to the kinds of places that Thomas visited when he purchased his ballads in Boston, and they buy the ballads wholesale though, and so they could go out and sell them on the streets and sing something like this next piece, The Embargo. And if you really liked it, you would put a little bit of money in, in the cup and take a sheet out of the basket, and you now have your own copy of The Embargo. So colonial instruments, uh, we've cataloged thousands of them. About 80% are violins and fiddles. They were cheap, they were easy to come by. Uh, you couldn't have a dance if you didn't have a fiddle player, and so they were exceptionally utilitarian. Uh, and, and so, and everything else is significantly lesser than that. Uh, flutes, second, uh, and then very much at the bottom are all these other instruments that we have. Good, have fun with. Um, hammered dulcimers, though, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. It's not only the numbers of instruments, it's how they were played. So there were lots of harp supports, but they stayed for the most part in the homes of the wealthy people. And uh, the vulgar didn't always get that invitation. <laughs> in fact, maybe never. And so, and so not a lot of people saw harps of chords being played. However, Hammered dulcimers, there were so few of them. I mean, we know of five hammered dulcimers in the colonies. Why do we call this an important colonial instrument? Because the people who played this instrument were gentlemen, or were men, uh, who were professional musicians, and they went town to town looking for a buck, um, a penny. Um, to play music for the masses. This instrument was a curiosity back then, as it is today. Um, but people went out to see this instrument, so it came to the people where the, the harpsichord, not so much. It stayed, stayed in the homes of the wealthy. So accompanying the embargo, the dulcimer. In this case, we're going to do the entire ballad. It's 10 verses, but they, they rock along rather quickly. Uh, a good composer of texts will pick a tune that has a nice lilt to it that everybody knows. And although not all men were members of the Freemasons, a lot of people knew the songs of the Freemasons. And so this is, this is set to a tune called the Entered Apprentices Song, or Come Let Us Prepare. And it marches through all the objections that people, especially up here in the maritime provinces, had when Jefferson imposed an embargo in 1806 to try to reconcile our differences with Great Britain in terms of trade. It was a horrible disaster. Uh, it was about as successful as prohibition, and like that, it had to be repealed. But these verses outline, outline how Americans felt about it, how the sailors felt about it, how the farmers felt about it, how the common people who were worried about the politicians. Could you imagine that today? <laughs> Um, and in fact, even some of these songs go, go far in accusing Jefferson of being in cahoots with Napoleon Bonaparte, as a Francophile as he was. So these words, while they rock along, I think they're exceedingly clever. The embargo. Dear sirs, it is wrong to demand a new song. I have left all the breath I can spare, no. With a muse I've conferred, but she won't say a word, it keeps laughing about the embargo. Our great politicians, those dealers and visions on paper do all length the year ago. But when called to decide like a turtle, they pop in their own pretty shell the embargo. In the time that we try to put out Britain's eye, I fear we shall let our own hair go. Yet still we're so wise we can see with French eyes, and then we should like the embargo. For a French privateer can have nothing to fear, she may load and may hear and may hear go. We love them so much, and their friendship is such, that we let them slip through the embargo. 
Our ships all in motion once whitened the ocean. They sailed and returned with a cargo. Now doomed to decay, they have fallen a prey to Jefferson, worms, and embargo. <laughs> Lest Britain should take a few men by mistake, who under false colors may dare go. We're manning their fleet with our tars who retreat from poverty, sloth, and embargo. What a fuss we have made about rights and free trade. Swore we'd not let our own share go. Now we can't for our souls bring a hake from the shoals. Tis a breach of the 20th embargo. <laughs> and our farmers so gay, how they galloped away. Twas money that made the old mare go. But now she won't stir for the wet or the spur till they take off her cloth the embargo. Tommy destroys a part of our joys, it will not let the beautiful fair go. They all will contrive to keep commerce alive, there's nothing we hate like embargo. Since our rulers design to deprive us of wine, tis best that we now have a rare go. Then each to his post and see who will do most to knock off the blocks of embargo. You guys ready to sing one with us now, perhaps? Your part's quite simple. <laughs> oh, one more first. I'm sorry, I wrote a string. Excuse me. I did. I will. I'll introduce this one. Sorry. <laughs> we'll sing it just a minute. Um, our next song is The Rose Tree. It is. Um, <laughs> it's a really funny song. It's the love, it's the great love song. It's the grand love song in a in a ballad opera that uh, was apparently George Washington's favorite ballad opera. It's called The Poor Soldier. And at the end of Act One, Patrick, the poor soldier, is coming home to his native Ireland after having fought in our revolution. He goes back to the home of the love of his life, Nora. And Nora is hiding someone in her closet. Um, and he has just found this gentleman in Nora's closet. And it's the end of Act One, and you have to sing the love song. And there's this really big problem. And so, so, <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange love song. Um, but it happens because you have to sing the love song in this place. Um, the rose tree the rose tree has a canker in it and that's he's in the closet. <laughs> Pay attention to the melody. We'll talk a little bit about this tune after. It's just two verses. Your voice could have changed the scene. 
the death of Wolf. This is a, a this is a often sung ballad about the death of our first great military hero, an Englishman named James Wolfe, who lost his life at the Battle of Quebec in the French and Indian Wars in 1759. And, uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's, uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with a, a, an amazingly large portrait of the bloody wolf on his death day. It's, uh, it's kind of like the R-rated art of the 18th century. There are three versions of this ballad in the collection, so clearly Wolf was still on Americans' minds. Again, some 50 years, more than 50 years after the fact. Again, selected verses. In this case, uh, we decided to introduce him in the first verse and then leave out the next six verses about his love life in England, because that doesn't really pertain to Americans. And then we'll pick it up on, on, on the plains of Abraham uh, as the French and the British were going at it. The death of Wolf. <laughs> Thank you. 